South Carolina ETV, South Carolina Public Radio, and The Post and Courier are co-presenters of this program. Good evening and welcome to the 2018 Republican gubernatorial primary runoff debate. From the Newberry Opera House, I'm Charles Bierbauer. Joining me tonight to question the candidates is Andy Shane of the Post and Courier. The top two vote getters in the Republican primary 10 days ago join us this evening. They are Henry McMaster and John Warren. Before we begin tonight, our ground rules, each candidate will have the opportunity to make a one-minute opening statement. From there, they'll have one minute to answer each of our questions. If necessary, I will allow a 30-second rebuttal. We drew uh, positions when the candidates arrived for the starting order. Governor McMaster, we'll begin with your opening statement. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, appreciate you being here. John, appreciate you being here. And I appreciate the television audience being here. I am proud to be your governor. There's nothing I would rather do, and that's why I'm doing this, and that's why I'm running for re-election. I'm proud of South Carolina. Everywhere I go, I try to look and act and do the things that you would expect your governor to do. In this race, we've heard a lot of negative charges, a lot of negative negativism. I don't believe in that. I think that the governor's purpose is to inspire the people to lead and to make things happen for the betterment. Today I was meeting with two different groups of people. Volvo's expanding their plant down in, towards Charleston and also I met another group that's talking about investing $4 billion. Ladies and gentlemen, our state is going right to the top. We have the potential for enormous prosperity. I want to be sure we get there and just in the time I've been your governor, I've announced $6 billion in new capital investment and almost 21,000 jobs. We're winning and I want to keep winning. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Good evening, I'm John Warren. I'm extremely happy to be here tonight. You know, last Tuesday, Republican voters across the state said, we do not want Governor McMaster's failed leadership. Over 58% of the voters said that. What they want is a new conservative reform movement. And what that movement represents is a group of conservatives across the state that want to bring solutions to our complex problems, because we have a lot. We have lost $4 billion with Santee Cooper, we're 50th in education, we're overtaxed, and the ones bearing the burden of that are the small business owners and the hardworking South Carolinians across the state. Our roads and our bridges are crumbling. We have no strategic plan for that. We're still funding Planned Parenthood. We have got to have new leadership, someone that can come in, bring positive change, positive solutions to our complex problems, and that's what I'm gonna do as governor. Gentlemen, thank you. Uh, let me ask this first question to, to both of you, starting with, with Mr. Warren. Your race has had a lot of labeling, not all of it very uh, flattering, but it comes down now to the two of you. One has been called a career politician, the other a rookie. Uh, let's get beyond the labels to the job skills. And starting with Mr. Warren, you talk a lot about military skills that translate to business and presumably business skills that you think will translate to government. What are those? And, and keep in mind that there's one piece in the chain of command in Columbia that's not in your uh, military experience, and that's dealing with an independent legislature. So it's a great question. I am proud to be a conservative outsider. It is true that I do not have government experience. But what I have experience in is leading Marines in intense combat and growing a successful business. And those two things will translate to great leadership and true accomplishment as a governor. You know, people ask me all the time, why does your military record translate? Well, number one, you can look at why did I go into the military to begin with? Our country was attacked. I went in to serve my country and lead Marines in combat. That is exactly why I'm going in to become governor. I want to fight for the taxpayer. I want to bring positive change. You know, in the military, in combat, we face a lot of obstacles. I know how to manage crisis. And I've done that repeatedly. And in terms of growing a successful business, I know the complex world of what all of our small businesses are facing because I've been there. I've created hundreds of jobs. I know how to bring companies to, to South Carolina because I've brought billions of dollars of investment myself here. 
And that's why uh, I asked the people to elect me. We've got to have someone with the right core competencies to lead the state. Thank We've you. got to have someone who's been successful in the thank, private sector. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McMaster, from your experience, what, what did you learn moving from lieutenant governor to governor? And why couldn't an outsider, if he's a quick study, pick that up? Well, because there's, there's, a, there's no real time for a learning curve. The, the governorship is not a place for on-the-job training. You have to have a basic understanding of how the government works and what your limitations are in the government and what, what your advantages are. But I need to go back about half of what my opponent said was wrong a little while ago. We've got a 10-year plan for fixing the bridges. It's been in implemented for over a year now, and Christy Hall issued a statement this morning. we got more people working now in South Carolina than we've ever had working before. Our unemployment rate is the lowest it's been since 2000. As I mentioned, I've announced, I've announced since I've been here $6 billion in new, in new capital investment and almost 21,000 jobs. I was with Nikki Haley this morning. She came down to Volvo, where she was instrumental, of course, in bringing them to South Carolina. I worked with them to get them to expand even before they started producing cars. We have to accentuate the positive in order to fix the problems we have. You can't go around the governor of all people. If you can't be positive, you shouldn't be governor. Governor, I was hoping you'd answer the question of what you learned when you shifted offices from lieutenant governor to governor. And maybe you could tuck that into this, this follow-up question. Okay. What rookie mistake are you concerned that Mr. Warren might make? Well, there could be a lot of them. One of them that, uh, that Mr. Warren and the others had announced was going to the legislature and, and bullying the legislators. Well, that's not the way to get things done. The governor must go to the legislature in order to, to work with the legislature. In, in politics is the art of addition, not the art of subtraction. And what you must do is to find ways to work with the people to convince them of the things that they need to do to get the job done. And you have to be positive in order to do that. But there's a lot of knowledge that is necessary to understand the way government functions and why it does not function. And to have a chief executive who is in, in charge of seeing that it functions who does not know how it functions is a dangerous thing to do. Now, I do I, I, uh, salute Mr. Warren on his military service, his honorable service. We have about 400,000 veterans in South Carolina and a strong military tradition. But the government is not the military. There's a difference. I have have the experience and I have a record of getting things done, very innovative things. I want to continue doing that. All right. And, and to Mr. Warren, what, what career politician flaw would you attribute to your opponent? Well, first of all, I find it very ironic that he thinks no experience is a negative when the more you tout than anything is the fact that you're supporting President Trump. President Trump had no government experience, and I think you're going around telling everyone, which I agree with, he's done some amazing things. So we need someone who's an outsider like Donald Trump to go to Columbia and drain the swamp. Uh, specifically, when we talk about career politicians, you know, you can work with the legislature. We've got a ton of great legislators, and I look forward to working with them. But we've got some rotten apples, one of whom you endorsed, Hugh Leatherman. Hugh Leatherman has been one of the worst things to hit South Carolina for the last 30 years. Hugh Leatherman doesn't care about our state. He doesn't care about making things better. He is profiting off the taxpayer. I'm not going to work with him, and I'm going to try to take him out in the next legislative or the next election in two years. And we've got to have someone that is going to fight for the taxpayer, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring true conservative reforms to South Carolina. Thank you. Andy Shane uh, has the next question. May I have a rebuttal? Uh, specific to, yes, of course. Yes. Donald Trump is a friend of mine. We have worked together. I campaigned all over South Carolina and parts of North Carolina with him. Donald Trump has been involved in politics for, for decades. You know, they wanted him to run for governor of New York. He, what, he elected, do it. what elected position did he Donald Trump in, have? He has been immersed in politics for many, many years. You can't years. cite anything that, that he's been Mr. involved Warren, in. I'm speaking. He's been involved in politics. He's a world figure. He is a well-known person. How has he been Donald involved Trump. in he's politics? He's a friend of mine. You're a good man, but you are not Donald Trump. And you were nowhere to be found during the Trump campaign. I campaigned for Donald Trump, worked for him in the primary, you were for Ted Cruz. To pretend that you're a follower of Donald Trump, Donald Trump is just 
inaccurate. Thank, thank you, Governor. Governor thank the, you. We're the, gonna, we're, hold on one second. We're going to move on to Mr. Shane's question. It will start with you, Mr. Warren. Okay. You each have spent a great deal of time campaigning around this state. What do you think the average South Carolinian is really concerned about? And this Mr. is being, Warren. Mr. Warren, I'm sorry, thank you. It's start with you. Well, I think it's multiple things. It's economic opportunity. It's education. When you look at all of the problems that we have going on in our state, it's massive. We're not winning. Political cronies are winning. So, you know, to begin with, those that are uh, using power from SCANA, uh, Santee Cooper, SCE and G, they're not winning. Their rates are gone up. They're continuing to pay for a failed nuclear plant. Uh, we're also concerned about education. We're 50th in education. Uh, it's getting worse. We don't have school choice. We're, we're still funding Planned Parenthood. Our roads and our bridges are crumbling. Let, let, let me start. What, what do you think, talking to voters out there, what are their main concerns? Well, I Is think they're worried about the future. They're worried about are their kids going to have economic opportunities. They're worried about their kids' education. Uh, I have two young kids right now, two and a half and four months. What I'm worried about is are they going to be able to go to public schools because schools continue to get worse? Is there going to be economic opportunity for them to get jobs here? So there's a variety of problems throughout our state, and we've got to have someone that understands the economy who has been successful in the private sector to get us back on track because right now we are not on track. Governor McMaster. They're worried about the economic future. They're worried about the future of their children. They're worried about public safety. They're worried about schools. And all of those areas are areas in which I've had successes. I've gotten things done, working across party lines, it, and sometimes it's been, been hard to do. But they want to have a, a trained, certified police officer in every school in South Carolina, in every district, in every county. When the legislature comes back, that was my proposal. That's going to be law. We also want no tax money, no tax money to go to Planned Parenthood. I've started that process. We will see that that's cut off. But the main thing that they want, they look, they're looking for leadership in the economy to have a new kind of prosperity that will lift all boats. And the answer to that, I know, because I've been there, is with the technical college system in South Carolina, which everyone says, including Wilbur Ross, U.S. Secretary of Commerce, is the best in the United States. That's what I take when I talk to these companies that are coming from around the world. They are impressed. They are thrilled with what they see in the people of South Carolina. Their pride, their hope, their willingness to work, and that is what I know how to do. I have a a record of accomplishment there, and I want to continue that. Thank you. And Andy's next question will start with you, Mr. McMaster. That said, taking away anything you've really said in your stump speeches, let's let's get what really worries you about what South Carolina. What are your biggest concerns about what's happening in this state or for its future at this point, and what you would obviously try to fix, make better, if you're governor or if you continue to be governor? It would be a lack of inspiration, a lack of hope, a lack of leadership. A leadership going in the wrong direction. That's why I say it takes knowledge, it takes experience to know how to do this. And a record of accomplishment is what gives people confidence in what they want to do for the future. I have that record of accomplishment. In fact, my proposals and my vision are just like President Trump's for the nation. We want to cut taxes. I've already issued the order to eliminate regulations. He asked for troops to go to the border. I sent troops to the border. We're going to have those police officers in every, every school. We're making great progress in South Carolina, and the, it is important that a leader stand tall for the people, understand what their problems are, and lead. I have a record of doing that, not only in this office, but in the lieutenant governor's office and back when I was U.S. attorney under Ronald Reagan. New ideas that didn't cost money, involved collaboration and work, and we got it all, got it, got it done for the people of this state. Mr. Warren, what worries you most about South Carolina at the moment? Right now, we live in the greatest state in the entire country, and the heart of our state are our people. Our people are honest, they're God-fearing, and they're hardworking. But what comes out of Columbia, it is the opposite of that. And the whole reason for that are three main reasons. Number one, we have too much corruption in Columbia. And we have people like Richard Quinn who have profited off the taxpayer for decades. Uh, number two, we have a lack of accountability. And you see this in our education system. You see it in DOT. And no one is accountable for the tax dollars that are wasted. 
And number three, it's total incompetence. We have way too many people appointed to boards and positions who should not be, who are not capable of managing those things. You see this with Santee well, Cooper. You see this with Santee Cooper to where only two board members have any energy sector experience. Governor McMaster's last pick is a lawyer. A lawyer doesn't know how to manage a power plant. We've got to have someone that knows how to build teams, build boards, and put the right people in situations to make our state great. I want to shift to health care. I've got a couple of questions I'd like to ask about health care. And this one will start with you, Mr. Warren. Uh, uh, polls show that, that for many voters, health care is indeed their number one concern. So what would be your top priority to improve health care for South Carolinians, and how would you achieve it? Well, number one, I agree with Nikki Haley. We do not need to expand Medicaid. Our, our state cannot afford that. That would be too big of an unfunded mandate over three years after that. Uh, what we need to do, like every industry, we need to bring more competition. The last thing that we need is Obamacare. So we've got to encourage uh, more competition, give people opportunities in terms of insurance as well, get insurance across state lines. Uh, then uh, one of the things that I hear across the uh, state, especially in the rural areas, that a lot of the rural hospitals are going out of business. So we need to think outside the box, think of telemedicine so that everyone can find a good, good doctor, and, but overall competition would be the best thing. Healthcare priorities, Mr. McMaster? Well, one was uh, dodging Obamacare, and that is why as Attorney General, I put together the group of Attorneys General, 13 of us, that brought the Obamacare lawsuit that ultimately went to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, uh, it, part of it w remains intact, and fortunately, President Trump has taken care of that. That is, a, it, is counterproductive, it is an abomination, and we need to, to get rid of it and get back to competition. But what I've done, if I, I have promoted a bill to allow nurse practitioners to work out into the ru rural areas without having the limitation on the number of miles from which they could be from a supervising physician and how many had to be there. We've gotten rid of that. So that will open things up out in those areas. I promoted telemedicine. I promoted uh, health care clinics and, and, and familiar with how, how those works. Yes, health care is, is a, a problem, but we don't need the centralization that came from Obamacare. We've got to get the free enterprise involved in it, and we'll be better off. Let me follow up with this. You mentioned nurse practitioners. Uh, the, the Office for Health Care Workforce forecasts a shortage of, in the neighborhood of 7,000 nurses in South Carolina a decade from now. At the same time, we already uh, have 20% fewer physicians than the national average. How do we rectify those issues of having sufficient uh, health care personnel? We have to encourage them to go into that field. For example, the nurse practitioners, when they limited to working under, had to have a physician a supervision within just a, a few miles, that limited that. That cut down on the number of people who wanted to go into that area. We have to encourage them to go into that area. But also one thing I, I failed to mention was the opioid crisis, which is a health crisis. It's, it's striking us uh, like it is the rest of the nation. But we've taken action, I've taken action. Back in October, we held a, a December, we had a, a task force put together and met and have come up with recommendations which are being implemented now. And just a few weeks ago, I signed legislation on nine separate laws that puts us in a collaborative pattern with the officials cooperating with each, each other, sharing information about the use of opioids, Thank requiring you. specialists to be uh, addiction specialists, and also requiring Thank the physicians you. to explain it to the parents of the children who are receiving off. Thank We're making great Thank progress you. in Thank that. You. Mr. Warren, more doctors, more nurses. Where do we get them? How do we afford them? Well, I think we can continue to encourage more doctors in South Carolina through a variety of ways. Number one, you know, Greenville just launched a new medical facility uh, and, and to have doctors uh, in Greenville as well as uh, we need to continue to have doctors incentivized. Uh, we can do that by offering tax incentives to hospitals, especially in the rural areas. One thing that's been debated is if you're a doctor 
you're a nurse practitioner and you go out to a rural area, you can have some of your student debt forgiven. Uh, that would be a, a way to encourage more doctors and more nurses. Overall, we need to create an environment here where people want to live and people want to move to, and right now it's not happening. Uh, so we've got to have tax reform, we've got to have strong education, we've got to have good infrastructure, and that's what I'm going to do as governor. Uh, Andy Shane has the next question, and we'll start with Mr. Warren. All right. The environment is a vital issue in South Carolina, especially along the coast. A recent Union of Concerned Sciences study, scientist study, excuse me, found that two South Carolina communities, Hilton Head and Johns Island, will have among the nation's highest number of homes that will routinely flood by 2045. And this is because we're going to obviously having uh, rising sea levels. Do you believe in global warming? And if so, what's the cause, Mr. Warren? You know, the environment is constantly changing. I don't believe necessarily all those figures. Al Gore, you know, is, was saying that we would be in, an, in uh, 10 degrees hotter right now, which never happened. So ultimately what we have to do is protect our number one industry, which is tourism. Uh, I applaud President Trump for his uh, American Energy Initiative. We've opened up drilling in Alaska, which I support. But uh, we've got to protect our environment here in South Carolina, especially our beaches, and that's why I'm opposed to offshore drilling. It wasn't about, my question wasn't about offshore drilling. It was about what do you think about global warming, and, and is there a cause, or do you? Uh, I, I don't know do you what believe? the cause is. Okay. You know, 20 years ago, people were talking about global cooling. So the the environment is constantly changing, and I think the science is undecided in terms of the cause. Governor, we go ahead, sir. I know the water's coming up in Charleston because it floods the city streets there about 50 or 60 times a year. And I have made taken steps to see that we study that. And this will involve drainage with the, uh, the Department of Transportation. I've talked to the mayor. I've talked to the mayor of North Charleston, the mayor of Charleston. And that is one of our economic engines. That's part of it, the city of Charleston. But again, let me interrupt. But what, do you believe in global warming? And if so, what do you think the cause is? Well, I think the way, yeah, it's getting, it's getting warmer now. Whether that fits your definition of global warming, I don't know. But it is getting warmer. And I know that the water is <laughs> the water coming up. Well, why do you think that is? Because the water's coming up. Well, OK. There must because? Be, there, must, <laughs> there must be something melting somewhere, I guess. OK. <laughs> And it's melting because? <laughs> <laughs> because it's warmer. <laughs> but uh, this is, this is uh, they're, they're, the people that study these things, it goes up and down. I mean, it certainly is going up now. And it, it's a real threat to us. And, and uh, this same thing along, along the coast. Uh, we had, uh, we, we got to be very careful with the coast, but we have to protect that economic engine. And I'm opposed, I was one of the first to come out to oppose the uh, drilling offshore and the testing. I've talked to the president about it, talked to the secretary Zinke about it. We're making progress on that. And let me tell you, this association with that administration is something that's important to the state of South Carolina. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andy, your next question starts with Mr. McMaster. Very good. Uh, we asked for some questions from our Post and Courier Palmetto Politics newsletter readers, and we have one from Wayne Floyd of Charleston who wants to know, where do you stand on offshore drilling, and are there any circumstances where you would want to allow it? Where was he a minute ago? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we have the question, so we want to go on. Yeah. He's watching. He's watching. What's his name? Uh, his name is Wayne Floyd from Charleston. Wayne Floyd. And what? he says he's, he's a native, so there we go. There you go. Well, he knows that the water's coming up all over. <laughs> I'm opposed to it, and I, and I tell you why. And I, I'm glad that the, the city of Greenville has come out, the city council uh, has come out and has opposed the testing and the drilling offshore. That is a major industry, an entire tourism industry. That is, a, I mean, we're living in paradise, and that's certainly a part of it. But uh, offshore drilling, number one, well, we, it, it's not necessary for national security. Number two, we can't take a chance with our coast. We do not have an industrialized coast. We don't want one. We're not set up that way. We're the complete opposite. We have people living in vacation on our coast. Number three, we don't have any place to put all the support mechanisms, the tanks and the trucks and the traffic, the refineries and all that that would be, have to come, accompany it. Number four, we're right in the middle of a hurricane zone, unlike any place else. How about an oil spill and a hurricane at the same time? And number five, they just found out we got bombs, ordnance from World War II dumped out there. Thank you, Mr. McMaster. We ought not drill out there. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Warren, same question. You, you, you discussed offshore drilling 
You discussed offshore drilling earlier, but obviously, would there be any circumstance that you could you could imagine offshore drilling off the coast of South Carolina? So I do not support offshore drilling. I uh, think again. Uh, we need to become less dependent on Middle Eastern oil. Uh, we do that by drilling in Alaska. We do it by encouraging drilling in the Dakotas, in Texas. Uh, our number one industry in South Carolina is tourism. I will protect that. I'm also a conservative, which means I believe in local rule. And I can tell you that if someone said in Greenville, we need to mine Table Rock or mine uh, Paris Mountain, I would be against it. Uh, so we've got to encourage that number one industry and protect it, and that's why I would be opposed to offshore drilling. What we need to do is encourage uh, more innovative energy sources like solar energy. We need to lift the caps uh, to prevent people or encourage people to go solar if they choose, and also encourage more competition in our energy sector here in South Carolina. Gentlemen, I want to drill down, as it were, further on health care. A couple more questions. Uh, and this will start with you, Mr. Warren. How would you approach the state's certification of need, which some physicians say uh, limits care to hospitals by constraining independent surgical centers and presumably adds to the cost? I would encourage independent surgical centers. Uh, I believe in competition. I think we need to encourage more of the private sector. Uh, more companies need to be here, uh, and that's what I would do for that. We don't need this certificate of need program that we, that we have now. There may, may be some part of it that should remain, but it, uh, probably 99% of it ought to be gone. That is the only way to see that we have true competition, and through competition, that's, that's where we have more health care. Can that be eliminated by, only by legislation? Yes. Okay. Let me ask another one. You, you both mentioned Medicaid. South Carolina is one of 17 states that has not expanded Medicaid. Uh, yes, it's a governor's prerogative to ask for it and, and or not, and Governor Haley did not, and then the legislature has to allocate the state contribution. But there are perceptions, at least, that Medicaid is tax money that goes from the states to Washington and then is reallocated. And by not expanding Medicaid, you are, in effect, leaving South Carolina tax money sitting in Washington or going to other states. So doesn't that deprive South Carolinians of some benefit? No. Uh, and, and I think we're starting this one with you, Governor. No, it does not, because that, it, it doesn't work that way. It, it, our money is not going somewhere else. Uh, we are not getting that money, but with that money comes strings. And you, that's the way we always get in trouble in this country, particularly with the federal government. You start accepting money for this or that, and next thing you know, you're tangled up and going in the opposite direction from where you wanted to go. Obamacare was a disaster. It is still a disaster. The, the health care system can be very much better in this country without a huge a, a monolithic bureaucracy like that strangling everything. That was a good decision that Governor Haley made, one of many good decisions, and I applauded her for it at that time. And I was, again, I was happy to be the attorney who led the AGs to bring the lawsuit to try to stop Obamacare before it came along. Uh, Mr. Warren, expand on your, on your rejection of expansion, please. Sure. Again, so I support Governor Haley's uh, decision not to expand Medicaid. Uh, when she did that, what it required was the government, the federal government was going to give us 70 percent, and we were going to have to come up with 30 percent. That 30 percent was very significant. Furthermore, uh, that was only guaranteed the 70 percent from the federal government for three years. So potentially we could have expanded and then been on the hook for the, the rest of the 70%, which could have bankrupted our state. So I was totally opposed to that. I continue to be, and we've got to find better solutions and better innovations to bring health care to uh, those that would use Medicaid. He's right about that. It was over $2 billion to start with. Andy, your next question starts with Mr. Warren. Very good. The nation's immigration policies have been top of the news for the past several days. And as you know, earlier today, President Trump issued an executive order ending the separation of children from undocumented immigrants who cross our borders. That said, what did you think of the policy of separating children from those undocumented immigrants? Well, what we said at the time when this, when this came out was we applauded uh, Governor, uh, President Trump's policy to build a wall. Uh, I fought in the military for our country's sovereignty. You cannot be a sovereign country without a, 
a border. And we have to protect the border. I support building the wall. And I said yesterday that President Trump was going to find a solution to that complex problem. And today he did. I applaud him for that. Uh, in terms of what we can do for illegal immigration here in South Carolina, it's twofold. I think both of us agree that we will prevent sanctuary cities in South Carolina. I want to take it a step further because one of the problems that we have is gang activity. And as governor, I will support uh, anyone arrested for gang activity having their immigration status. Is checked. But Mr. Warren, let me ask you, what was your reaction during the period when more than uh, about 2,000 children were separated from the I, from undocumented immigrants? I answered that question, which was I knew that President Trump was going to come up with a solution to that. Today he did the executive order and he came up with the solution. Thank you. Governor McMaster. Well, President Trump was in a box because, as you recall, there was a settlement in 1997 that uh, required the children to go to other places to be uh, put into custody of relatives or guardians and all that. And o President Obama uh, issued a, a, an order to require them to stay together, which was found to be unconstitutional. So what did he do then? He did the wrong thing. Instead of enforcing the rule of law, he just it lifted the law and let everyone come in. And that is how one of those valves got open wide coming in. President Trump came along and reversed that illegal order and said, follow the law. And we knew then that he was going to find a way to, to fix the problems he, that came from could, that. And could that's President, precisely what he did. But could President Trump have issued the, that executive order when they decided to adopt the zero tolerance policy to prevent this from happening in the first place? Well. He, what he did, he issued it very quickly, and he issued it, uh, and he did it the right way. And part of his order is to have that settlement agreement changed through the court process. He follows the rule of law. The prior administration did not. If we don't have borders, then we cannot have a country. And he's right on that, and I am uh, support him 100 percent. Your next question starts with Mr. McMaster. Let's be honest. You both keep agreeing with President Trump. Obviously, you both are supportive of President Trump. But is there not one thing that you wish maybe the president had done differently, maybe during his time in, in the administration? Maybe so. Anything? I, th I think he is a magnificent man, as I say. Uh, but we didn't both uh, support him when it counted. I was there as his state chairman in South Carolina, and they tell me the first elected official in the country to support then candidate Trump. And Mr. Warren was not at those meetings, not at the inauguration. I, I don't know where Mr. Warren was, but President Trump is taking us in the right direction. But there's, so, nothing, there's nothing that he's done where you've said, I wish he had done this differently. I'm so happy he is president. He has a different way of doing things than others do. But he has taken us in the right direction. The wealth is going up in the country. The stock market is going wild. We've got more people employed than ever before, including in South Carolina. And what I want, what I do, he and I are doing the same kind of things, re removing regulations and getting rid of taxes on the people. And one of them, the most important, in order to re reward the military veterans, the, the, that is the career veterans, law enforcement, firefighters, and peace officers, is no income tax at all on their retirement income. Now, that's an idea we have. I don't know if they go, if he's going to have that Thank idea, you. too, but I hope he does. Thank you. Mr. Warren. Well, where I was during the inauguration was I was in the private sector creating jobs and being a productive member of society. Uh, in terms of President... <laughs> In terms of who we supported, I did initially support Ted Cruz because I thought he was a true conservative. You, on the other hand, supported Lindsey Graham. So very far cry from being a conservative. Uh, in terms of what President Trump has done well, he's done an amazing job with the Supreme Court justice. He's done a great job of ta comprehensive tax reform, of deregulating a lot of things. And also, I can't believe it, but he ended the uh, Cold War in Korea. So I but, applaud him on that. But is there not anything you think he would do differently? The area where I would disagree with President Trump on is tariffs. I think tariffs, especially on steel and aluminum, hurt South Carolinian jobs. I was with uh, a plant the other day called uh, in Somerville. They import 100 tons of steel a month. They do that because they can't find that steel anywhere else in America. So that would be one area where I would differ with them on. Uh, uh, rebuttal, rebuttal. Go ahead. On the tariffs, that's still a work in progress. And I've been talking to the companies here and as well as the administration. But on supporting Trump, that's right, I did support Lindsey Graham. 
He was a favorite son. I was for him. When he got out, I was the first elected official in the country, according to the Trump campaign, to support President Trump. I supported him vigorously in the primary. My opponent, Mr. Warren, did not. He was supporting Ted Cruz. So it is misleading, again, misleading. Let's stick with the truth. I was supporting Mr. Trump when it counted. My opponent was supporting someone else. There's, there's... You, you, you may respond. There's nothing misleading with what I said. What I said was, initially, you were supporting Lindsey Graham. And I think a lot of thousands of conservatives across the state would agree that Lindsey Graham is not our favorite son. Andy has one more question in this round. It will start with Mr. Warren. Okay. It was announced yesterday that President Trump and Vice President Pence are going to come here and campaign for Governor McMaster in the final days before the runoff. It's uh, really visits that have been called unprecedented. Um, for Mr. Warren, let me ask you first, how is this not a rebuke of your claim that you are the candidate that's most like Donald Trump in this election? Uh, ultimately, my support have a lot of Donald Trump supporters. Donald Trump has about a 90% approval here in South Carolina. If all of his supporters supported Henry McMaster, we wouldn't be on this stage right now. He wouldn't have been at 42%. So, so when you look at our record and our record of accomplishment, Donald Trump is anti-establishment. Donald Trump is anti-politician. I am the only person on this stage that has ever been successful in the private sector. I am the only person that's going to go down to Columbia and fight for the taxpayer. One thing that uh, Governor McMaster always talks about is Donald Trump, but the other thing that he never mentions is the taxpayer. I am only beholding to the taxpayer, and that's very similar to Donald Trump. <laughs> Governor McMaster, for you, there is some perception that this is a sign that there's a little bit of desperation. Maybe you're worried about obviously losing to, to Mr. Warren because of these visits. What would be your response to that? No, I'm not worried about that. I am delighted that Donald Trump wants to come to South Carolina. I think he loves the people here about as much as I do, if that's possible. And he said so over and over from the, from the podium when I was campaigning with him all over South Carolina. And uh, he, also President, uh, Vice President Pence is coming. I know they, they know the importance of South Carolina in the political climate of the country. They see us as a leader with great economic progress, great leadership, and they are coming in recognition of that. Governor McMaster, I want to start this question with you, but I want both of you to respond to it. It's June 20th, and the General Assembly has yet to pass a budget for the coming fiscal year, which starts in 11 days. Uh, they'll be in session next week. So my, what message would you send to the legislators as to what you feel is necessary, what is acceptable, and what is veto bait if they pass it? Now, this question is real for you. It's a little more hypothetical for you, but I'd like to get both of your responses to it. Well, one thing I, w I have asked them to do is to see to it that they pass the Sanctuary City Bill, which, it, which I have promoted, which will make us truly sanctuary city free now and forever, and also the bill that will allow a certified trained police officer a start on putting a certified trained police officer in every, in every district, in every school in South Carolina. What I will veto is anything that does not, that allows the burden of the failed decisions of Scanner and Santee Cooper to have those ratepayers continue to pay for the nuclear reactors they're not going to get. Now, I told them I was going to veto that. If, it, if, it, if anything comes across my desk that does anything more than charge them zero, I will, I will veto that. I was the one that led the effort to open up Santee Cooper, to open up the records of Scanner, the Bechtel report, the records that we got from the FBI, all, and I had to remove the chairman of Santee Cooper in order to get that done. But I'm the one who has been forcing the change and the transparency in this. Thank I'm the most Thank transparent. You. Thank you. Mr. Warren, put yourself in that position. The veto pen's the biggest weapon you've got. In terms of the budget, what is shameful in our state is the fact that we still fund Planned Parenthood. And as governor, I will not sign a bill that funds one cent to Planned Parenthood. That should have already been done, and with real leadership, we can get that accomplished. <laughs> in terms, the governor mentioned Scanna, Santee Cooper. I'm, 
I'm the only one on this stage that has not taken hundreds and thousands of dollars from Scana, Dominion, and Santee Cooper. And when it was called for the merger to bail out Santee Cooper or bail out Scana and Dominion, you were initially for that. I will never, ever allow taxpayer funds or ratepayers to bail out private sectors, and that will not happen in my administration. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I need, a, need a rebuttal. You, you want if, to respond to the, I, to the I do. If, funds? Mr. if Mr. Warren is accusing, he's been accusing me in this entire campaign, and the, the others who were doing so are not here anymore. But if he's accusing me of somehow showing favoritism for Santee, Cooper, and Scanner, I think he needs to go back and look at the record, because I'm the one that opened up the, all the what has been happening, the misdeeds and the corruption, and I am the one who began that process. I'm the one who now has the legislature agreeing with me to set up a group, a commission, to receive the offers and such to see that we do find a common sense a free enterprise solution, whether it's from Dominion or someone else, but I have said I will veto anything that requires those customers Thank to keep you. paying for those reactors. Mr. Warren, you may have 30 seconds for a rejoinder. There are two facts that are without question. Number one, you initially supported taxpayer funds bailing out the merger of Scana and Dominion. Number two, under your leadership, the ratepayers in South Carolina are still paying for a failed nuclear reactor that is never going to come online, and that would not have happened had I been governor. Well, you would have had been governor about 20 years ago when all those laws were passed. You blame me for those laws and all you, that you're saying. Going on? <laughs> Listen, Mr. Warren, you need to know how it works. That's, that is, I understand it, how it works. It is necessary to what have you some have, knowledge of government if you're going to be governor. What you have is <laughs> Mr. Warren. This, this is an example of failed leadership and excuse after excuse after excuse. We've got to have real leadership that can take responsibility for the problems that we have and come up with solutions rather than just everything's great in South Carolina. Let's, let's, uh, let's stay in the State House for a moment because this is, this is the reality of the relationship that exists between the governor's office and the legislators. In the last debate, Mr. Warren, I want to start with you on this question. Um, you, you, you kind of laid into Hugh Leatherman four times by my count once so far tonight. Is that it? A lot of people, that, that was all. <laughs> a, a lot of people refer to him as the, the most powerful man in Columbia. So how are you going to deal with this guy? He's the reality you would face if you're in the governor's office. Ultimately, I believe that we have so many great people who are serving the taxpayers in Columbia. You know, there were over 300 positive bills passed in the House. The problem is they get to the Senate and they oftentimes die. We have got to have a governor who is going to fight for the taxpayer. Governor McMaster supports Hugh Leatherman. You cannot work with Hugh Leatherman if you're a conservative. So what I will do and what I said from the beginning of this campaign, I will systematically target the few rotten apples that we have in the Senate. I will find quality candidates to run against them. I will help them get financing and I will campaign with them in order to change the makeup of the legislature. That is the only way to get true conservative reforms accomplished. That is how we bring accountability to our government. That's how we get accountability to our education system, accountability to DOT. You cannot work with Hugh Leatherman. He doesn't want to work for the taxpayer and I will not do that as governor. Mr. McMaster, how do you deal with Leatherman? Well, it's the way I've been dealing with him. There's some, some things where if uh, Mr. Warren were to look at the record on the Senate record to see things that Mr. Leatherman was uh, proposing that I ruled out of order a number of times, which stopped it right there. I have not agreed with him on many different issues uh, in the time that I've been Lieutenant Governor and Governor, and, and he knows that, and I know it, and I think everybody knows it except Mr. Warren. There was a clear choice two years ago when Hugh Leatherman was up for election. It was Richard Skipper, who is a good conservative Christian businessman, and there was Hugh Leatherman. And you were on the side of Hugh Leatherman. That's just a fact. That's not me misleading anyone. That's just a fact. And that is wrong for the taxpayers of South Carolina. That's one of the reasons why our roads are crumbling, why Florence has interstates that no one uses there. But the rest of us suffer. Andy Shane's next question starts with Mr. McMaster. 
South Carolina has been getting a lot of attention from the business community. It's fair to say we're becoming a global state. You think about BMW, you think about companies like Giddy Tire or like Samsung here in Newberry, or like Volvo, of course, which just debuted the car that it's going to build outside of Charleston. That said, with all that attention, we still have monuments to the Confederacy and post-Reconstruction that offend some people, hurt some people. Is it time to remove those monuments and also try to promote changing the Heritage Act, which makes it difficult to remove those monuments? Well, you're right. There are a lot of businesses all around the world that are looking at South Carolina, and I was with two of them this morning. They are very positive about our state. They know that we have the best technical college system in the whole world, and my, my proposal to them is to collaborate with the technical college systems and also the research universities, and they're doing that, and that's where the brain power is. That's something that we have that other states don't do. But in 2000, we passed the Heritage Act. I supported the Heritage Act. It is a good act. I believe it should be enforced. But do you not think that it's too high of a bar for, especially like local governments, to just want to make some simple changes? It, still, it takes two-thirds majority of both the House and the Senate in order for anything to be, Mr. To be Chain, changed. As you remember, there was a lot of debate over a lot of years about these very issues, and that was resolved in the Heritage Act, which passed. I don't think it was unanimous, but it was a, it passed with a very with very strong support, not only in the legislature but around the state. I think it is a good law. It is the best approach that we've come up with so far, and I, I support it 100 percent. Mr. Warren. I support the Heritage Act. The Heritage Act. Uh, what we need to do is continue to move South Carolina forward. Uh, what we saw with the Mother Manual shooting was a unification of our state against hate. You see that we have a strong uh, state, that we're unified, that we share so many core values. I will continue to promote that as governor. Do you think at all that, that by removing these monuments or by making at least some change to the Heritage Act to put these, it in the hands these, of local governments these, might, might, these might, might make These monuments are not impacting anyone okay. in a negative way. I support the Heritage Act, and we need to move on and focus on the real issues that are affecting South Carolinians across our state. Okay. All right. Your next question, Andy, starts with Mr. Warren. Okay. Um, you are two white candidates who want to represent residents in a state where one out of every three South Carolinian is not white. How do you relate to the experience of minorities in the state, and how do you help minorities, a larger percentage of whom are in poverty? So I think when you look at my, my record as an adult, I've served in very diverse organizations. The Marine Corps provides an amazing roadmap as well as all of our military branches. Uh, we have so much diversity in the Marine Corps. Same thing at Lima One Capital. Uh, we have a diverse workforce there. And what makes those two organizations so unique is that they focus on two things. Number one, we hire people based on shared core values, and then we train them to uh, help them uh, be trained for the job specific role. As governor, what I want to do, I want to rise, allow everyone to rise. I want to bring hope to all of the people of South Carolina. We do that with our education system. We need more school choice. No parent should have to send their child to a failing school. I want to do it with the tax code. I want to lift the taxes off of so many South Carolinians that keeps them in poverty, and that is the way to provide economic opportunity and hope for all South Carolinians. Governor McMaster. Over the years, I've been to the so-called card of shame. I've had experiences uh, all over the state, and I know that, for example, that poverty is the enemy of education. So how do you, how do you get rid of, of poverty? Well, you have to have economic growth. You have to keep the people safe, and you have to have good schools, but in order to have the money to do these things, you must have great economic growth. That is why the economic prosperity of this state is, is my core focus on moving all the people forward. I believe that as the Good Shepherd would leave the 99 to go find the one, I think that's what we must do. We, we have families that are dysfunctional in South Carolina. And if you look closely, you'll find out that we have several generations, seven, several generations, one, two, three, or four, in the house where no one has held, well, held a steady job. How do we job. do that? What, what, you what, do what, it through what, economic growth. You, okay. do it, you do it through having good teachers and good schools. We're going to have to consolidate some schools to save, save some money. 
money, we're going to have to have that police officer, trained police officer in those schools, and we have to build this economy to open the door and provide a ladder up for all of those people. And our technical colleges are really the key to doing that once we get them up through the third grade. It's, it's a difficult task, but, but we can do it. We have people that are dedicated to doing it, and I'm Thank one of them. And now that I will be in charge of appointing the superintendent of education, we could get a lot more done in South Carolina in education that reform. That doesn't come until 2022. That's right, but I'm starting now. Okay. <laughs> I, hear you, I hear you both. I hear you both talking about cutting taxes. I think you said you'd want to cut $2.2 billion. In, 15%. In, and, and, Mr. Warren, you've talked about closing loopholes. I don't hear the specifics. So where are those tax cuts? That's the income tax. Where to, and yeah, by how it, much? Take it for 15%. It's 7% is the highest tax. Now take it down 15%. That'd be just under 6%, I think. North, listen, North Carolina and Georgia and all the other southern states and Kentucky and uh, Tennessee are competing with us. I talked to the people there. I know a lot of them, and they are competing with us. North Carolina cut their income tax in order to compete with us. Georgia just recently, about a month ago, cut their income tax in order to compete with us. What we did, we raised our gas tax when we didn't need to if we'd just been spending all the money that came in from it on the roads to begin with. That's why I vetoed that tax. But when they saw us doing that, what'd they do? They cut their tax on gas. So we, we, we are in a fierce competition. That is why at this moment, the most important thing we need to do is have experienced leadership in the chief executive's office, in the governor's office. We cannot drop the ball now. We cannot slow down now. We don't have time for on-the-job training. We have to keep pushing in the very successful direction in which we've been going. Thank you. Where are those loopholes you're going to close, Mr. Warren? Governor McMaster talks about he's in favor of tax cuts. He's been governor for over a year, and we haven't gotten any. So we need to change the code. Uh, number one, what we have to do is we need to go ultimately to a fair tax. If Tennessee, if Texas, if Florida, if those states can do it, we can do it. That would stimulate so much economic opportunity. You have to do it incrementally. One of the major steps in order to do that, what we could do is close the special interest loopholes for the sales tax. When the sales tax came out, 48% of the goods sold were taxed. But right now, it's down to 31%. If we just got rid of those special interest loopholes, we could cut the income tax by half and the overall sales tax by half. That would create a ton of economic opportunity. And we've got to have someone that understands the economy, who has created hundreds of jobs to get these reforms done, who actually understands how the economy works. We're, uh, we're in the home stretch, gentlemen. I'm going to ask you. Uh, for a 30-second response to this question, we'd like to get a couple more questions in here. This is the first time that candidates for governor are running on a ticket with a lieutenant governor candidate. The odds are the voters may know a little bit about you and probably less about your, uh, your running mate. So can you tell us uh, what made you choose your running mate and what is it that he or she brings to the ticket that you might not? Mr. Warren. I'm very proud of the fact that I chose Pat McKinney. Pat McKinney is a Charleston native. He's been very successful in the private sector. Uh, he also has been chairman of the ports. And there, he uncovered the corrupt Richard Quinn. There, Richard Quinn was getting uh, unwritten paid contracts. And what did Governor McMaster do when my lieutenant governor exposed Richard Quinn's corrupt uh, antics there? You didn't renew his contract. Who did you put in charge of the ports then? Uh, someone from Scana. So I'm very proud of Governor McMaster. He's a, I mean, uh, Pat McKinney. He's a. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that as an endorsement. I'm very proud of Pat McKinney, and uh, I look forward to him serving as my lieutenant governor. Thank you, Mr. McMaster. Tell us about your running. Well, man. he's wrong about that again. I, I didn't uh, remove Pat. Pat had been, his term had expired a year before our went into the governor's Did office. Did you renew his contract? No, I didn't renew it, okay. but I let it, but he stayed there until I got someone to come you in. You got 30 yeah. seconds to tell us 26 now to tell us about your running mate. Well, there she is right there. Where's Pamela Evans? There she is. <laughs> Pamela and her husband David, and I see the son Jackson. I think that's Jackson. What did she Jackson. bring to the ticket that you don't? Man, she is a businesswoman unlike anybody, certainly on this stage. She's won every... <laughs> She has won every award that there is national. She's number seven on the fastest growing female owned business in the world. She's won awards in Greenville. She has business, but she is conservative. She was a Trumper with Thank the you. inauguration together, and she brings great skill to Thank this. You. Thank you. Andy, your next question. 
All right. So besides spending time with your family, how do you de-stress? I mean, you both have stressful lives. How, what do you do to de-stress? Well, I chased my two and a half year old all, the, all around. I took him to the zoo the other day. I came back. What, I, what else do you, besides your family, what else do you do? I love going to uh, work out. I love going to the lake. I love studying military history, but ultimately I just love spending time with my family. Governor McGlancer. I, I love history. I, I try to read as much as I can. If you have not read, read Walter Edgar's History of South Carolina, you better, better do it. They're still selling the books. I have a great wife, two great children. There's Peggy there. There's Henry D. right there. And Mary Rogers is in Scotland right now. But I got a bulldog named Little Mac. And right now, he's 15 <laughs> months old. He is a beauty. And I love that dog. And he is a stress remover. He's better than squeezing those little balls that you can get those little <laughs> things. We've, we've got time for one last short question, Andy. All right. Um, despite having Republican majorities in the legislature and in Come statewide on, offices, <laughs> consensus has been hard to find. What do you think is the source of the party's division right now? Well, I think what you have in the legislature, you actually have three parties. You have Democrats who believe in a liberal platform. They say they believe in it, and they enforce the liberal platform. Then you have conservatives who believe in the Republican platform, and then you have Republicans like Hugh Leatherman who are actually Democrats and support the Democratic agenda. And that's why the Republican Party is split. That's why we've got to get more true conservatives to be Republicans and go down there and fight for the taxpayer. And that's what I will encourage as governor. Governor, governor McMaster, why is, the, why is the party split right now? Well, I need to say that I, I do support Hugh Leatherman when he's right, and I oppose him when he's wrong, like everybody else in the legislature, and everybody knows that. I think the party is split more at the national level than it is now. I have never seen such misleading information, such a lack of transparency, uh, such a uh, lack of truthfulness at the national level, such division, and I'm not quite sure where it came from. I'm the most transparent candidate that we've, we've ever had. I've put out 17 years of tax returns. My life is, is an open book. My opponent has declined to do that. I wish he would do that. But we, we need to focus on the core issues that make us strong and keep us together, and that is the principles of this conservative Republican Party. And, and we need to wrap, unless you want to talk about your taxes, will you? Well, the only thing I'll talk about taxes, if you want I to talk need, about taxes. I need a yes or a no. If you want to talk about taxes, you should explain why you've been delinquent well, 31 times we'll on your taxes. We'll have to do it another time, then. <laughs> thank so, thank you. Uh, thank you both for being with us. Thank you, Andy Shane. Thank all of you. Please don't forget to vote in the runoff next Tuesday. For SCETV and South Carolina Public Radio, I'm Charles Beerbaum.